Good morning. I'm really delighted we can have this many people come out for a meeting. It says something, I think, about the way you regard yourself as owners. We're going to hustle through the, uh, the business meeting, and then uh, Charlie and I will be here for uh, six hours or until our candy runs out uh, uh, to answer any questions you have. We have people in a number of rem remote locations, and we have ways of uh, bringing them in for the questions as well. Uh, incidentally, if you hadn't figured it out already, this hyperkinetic bundle of energy here on my left is Charlie Munger, our <laughs> vice chairman. And uh, we will now uh, run through the uh, business of the meeting. The uh, meeting will now come to order. I'm Warren Buffett, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the company. I welcome you to this 1999 annual meeting of shareholders. I will first introduce the Berkshire Hathaway directors that are present in addition to myself. And if you'll stand up, it's a little hard for me to see that right down here in the front row. We have Susan T. Buffett. If you'll stand and remain standing, please. If you encourage her, she'll sing another song. Uh, Howard G. Buffett, don't encourage him to sing a song. <laughs> Malcolm G. Chase. Charlie, you've already met. Ronald L. Olson. Ron. And Walter Scott, Jr. Also with us today are partners in the firm of Deloitte & Touche, our auditors. They are available to respond to appropriate questions you might have concerning their firm's audit of the accounts of Berkshire. Mr. Forrest Crutter is Secretary of Berkshire. He will make a written record of the proceedings. Ms. Becky Amick has been appointed Inspector of Elections at this meeting. She will certify to the count of votes cast in the election for directors. The named proxy holders for this meeting are Walter Scott, Jr. and Mark D. Hamburg. Proxy cards have been returned through last Friday, representing 1,133,684 Class A Berkshire shares and 3,485,885 Class B Berkshire shares to be voted by the proxy holders as indicated on the cards. That number of shares represents a quorum, and we will therefore directly proceed with the meeting. We will conduct the business of the meeting and then adjourn the formal meeting. After that, we will entertain questions that you might have. Does the Secretary have a report of the number of Berkshire shares outstanding entitled to vote and represented at the meeting? Yes, I do. As indicated in the proxy statement that accompanied the notice of this meeting that was sent by first class mail to all shareholders of record on March 5, 1999, being the record date for this meeting, there were 1,343,592 shares of Class A Berkshire Hathaway common stock outstanding, with each share entitled to one vote on motions considered at the meeting, and 5,266,338 shares of Class B Berkshire Hathaway common stock outstanding, with each share entitled to one two hundredth of one vote on motions considered at the meeting. Of that number, 1,133,684 Class A shares and 3,485,885 Class B shares are represented at this meeting by proxies returned through last Friday. Uh, thank you, Forrest. The one item of business of this meeting is to elect directors. If a shareholder is present who wishes to withdraw a proxy previously sent in and vote in person on the election of directors, he or she may do so. Also, if any shareholder that is present has not turned in a proxy and desires a ballot in order to vote in person, you may do so. If you wish to do this, please identify yourself to meeting officials in the aisles who will furnish a ballot to you. Would those persons desiring ballots please identify themselves so that we may distribute them? I'd like to make one comment uh, before we proceed to the election of directors, and that's that in the general re-proxy material, the material relating to the general re-merger, it was stated that, it, that the intention was to have Ron Ferguson, the CEO of General Re, join the board of Berkshire Hathaway, and that offer 
was extended and still remains open and will remain open uh, for his lifetime and mine at least uh, uh, to Ron, for Ron to join the board. Uh, after thinking about it, he decided that he preferred not to be on the board and in that judgment he, he concurs with my feelings generally about boards in, in that uh, they can restrict your, it can restrict your activities in purchase and sale of the stock, for example, if you do it in a six-month period, you're automatically in trouble uh, uh, with the, uh, and you have to return any profit to, uh, as, as calculated in a rather peculiar way to the company. It, it means that your compensation system is laid out for the world to see. There may be some tax restrictions uh, in terms of the deductibility of, 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 of salary paid. And so Ron uh, notified me a little bit uh, before the proxy material went out that he preferred at least to defer any decision on, uh, on joining the board. I, I can tell you that it has cost Berkshire uh, significant money by uh, the fact that Charlie and I have been on various boards because your, your hands are tied in many respects. Even if you don't have any uh, knowledge of any, anything that might be of material plus or minus, the very fact that it might be imputed to you uh, can, can, uh, can restrict action significantly. So. Uh, uh, we make a point of not trying to be on very many boards. Charlie and I have only gone on boards where we have very significant investments by Berkshire, uh, and sometimes those have caused us to take on a job that we didn't intend originally, as that Solomon movie showed. Um, so, Ron, the offer is 100% open to Ron at any time, and uh, if he changes his mind in any way, he will be on the board. But that explains the discrepancy be between the actions uh, that are being taken this morning and what was described as, as likely to happen in the uh, proxy material. Now, with that explanation, I would like to uh, recognize Walter Scott, Jr. to place a motion before the meeting with respect to election of directors. Walter. I move the Warren E. Buffett, Susan T. Buffett, Howard G. Buffett, Malcolm G. Chase, Charles T. Munger, Ronald L. Olson, and Walter Scott, Jr. be elected as directors. Is there a second? Somebody should second it. Second <laughs> we got a second down there, Susan? Oh, good, okay. It has been moved and seconded that Warren E. Buffett, Susan T. Buffett, Howard G. Buffett, Malcolm G. Chase, Charles T. Munger, Ronald L. Olson, and Walter Scott, Jr. be elected as directors. Are there any other nominations? Long enough? Is there any discussion? Long enough? The nominations are ready to be acted upon. If there are any shareholders voting in person, they should now mark their ballots on the election of directors and allow the ballots to be delivered to the inspector of election. Will the proxy holders please also submit to the inspector of election a ballot on the election of directors voting the proxies in accordance with the instructions they have received. Ms. Amick, when you are ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Friday cast not less than 1,145,271 votes for each nominee. That number far exceeds a majority of the number of the total votes related to all Class A and Class B shares outstanding. The certification required by Delaware law of the precise count of the votes, including the additional votes to be cast by the proxy holders in response to proxies delivered at this meeting as well as those cast in person at this meeting, if any, will be given to the secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Amick. Warren E. Buffett, Susan T. Buffett, Howard G. Buffett, Malcolm G. Chase, Charles D. Munger, Ronald L. Olson, and Walter Scott, Jr. have been elected as directors. After adjournment of the business meeting, I will respond to questions that you may have that relate to the business of Berkshire, but do not call for any action at this meeting. Does anyone have any further business to come before this meeting before we adjourn? If not, I recognize Mr. Walter Scott, Jr. to place a motion before the meeting. I move this meeting be adjourned. Is there a second? A motion to adjourn has been made and seconded. We will vote by voice. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. All opposed say I'm leaving. No, say no, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, the meeting is adjourned. Now we'll move forward. Thank you. I ask you, was Joe Stalin ever any better? I mean, <laughs> uh, we will, we have the, uh, 
we have this room broken into eight zones, and then we have five more zones from uh, uh, various off-site locations, and we will move in order. We have microphones that you can uh, uh, go to, and we have a monitor in each microphone that will line people up. We will rotate around uh, uh, the 13 zones. There's just uh, one question uh, per person. Uh, I would ask that you identify yourself and uh, uh, state where you're from. Now, you have to be a little careful on that because a lot of people will say that, the, who really aren't, will say that they're from Nebraska for status reasons. But uh, if, <laughs> if, if you get beyond that, uh, uh, we, will, we will try to identify where everybody is from. And we'll start off in, uh, in Zone 1, which is on the right here at the front. Hello, my name's uh, Tim Spear, and I'm from Hertfordshire, England. Uh, I was uh, thinking, in, in Ben Graham's book, The Intelligence Investor, he spends uh, the first couple of chapters discussing the level of the market and whether it would uh, save for investment. I was wondering what you'd think of the uh, market today. Well, we don't, Charlie and I don't think about the market. And, and, I, and Ben didn't very much. He, I think he made a mistake to occasionally try and place a value on it. Uh, we look at individual businesses, and uh, we don't think of stocks as as uh, little items that wiggle around in the paper and that uh, have charts attached to them. Uh, uh, we think of them as parts of businesses, and and it is true that currently we have great trouble finding businesses that we both like and where we like the management and that they and find them at an attractive price so we do not find bargains in this market among the larger companies that are that are our universe um, that is not a stock market forecast in any way shape or form we have no idea whether the market's going to go up uh, today or next week or next month or next year uh, we do know that we will only buy things that we think make sense in terms of the value that we receive for, for Berkshire. And when we can't find things, the money piles up. And when we, find, when we do find things, we pile in. Uh, uh, but the, the stock market, uh, I, I know of no one that has been successful at, uh, and, and really made a lot of money predicting the actions of the market itself. I know a lot of people who have done well uh, picking businesses and buying them at sensible prices. Uh, and that's what we're hoping to do. Charlie? How could you say it any better? <laughs> yeah, but the question is whether you can say it better, Charlie. <laughs> OK, we'll go to uh, zone two. That may be all you hear from him today. At, uh, <laughs> get used to it. <laughs> uh, good morning. Morning. David, David Winters, Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. Um, could you give us a few hints about the incremental value of Jen Rees float under the Berkshire Hathaway umbrella and the potential for the growth of Jen Rees float over the long term. Yeah. Uh, Jen Rees float, is, which is now available to Berkshire, it's a 100% owned subsidiary, although part of that float is attributable to Cologne, which is only an 83% owned subsidiary of, of Jen Rees and, and, and also uh, Berkshire. But that, I would say the incremental value today because it's under the Berkshire umbrella, is zero, because we are bringing nothing to the party that Jen Rees own investment people would not have brought to the party. Uh, we obviously think that there will be important incremental value over a long period of time. We, but when that value will appear or how much, uh, how much of it develops uh, is a matter that's out of our hands. Uh, we right now have close to 24 billion uh, in total invested assets at at uh, Genry and Cologne. Like I say, 83% of the Cologne part is ours, and 17% is uh, belongs to somebody else. Uh, but we are bringing nothing to that party right now in terms of uh, any managerial skill that is going to add value. Uh, I would hope that over over time we would. The second question as to the growth of float, uh, the growth of float at, at, at uh, General Rhee and Cologne uh, will certainly be very slow in the short term. Uh, the, the growth of float at GEICO will be significant. 
uh, percentage-wise. Uh, the reinsurance business uh, does, does not have the same potential for growth as we have at GEICO, and, and growth is much slower to come about because uh, there are longer-term contractual commitments that people are reluctant to change reinsurers, and they should be. We agree with that. Uh, so you, at, at a level of six billion or so of premium volume and already 14 billion of float, you, you won't have any, you won't have growth of float unless premium volume is, becomes significantly higher in the future. I think that will happen over time. It will not happen in the short term. Charlie, if I may interrupt your breakfast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got nothing to add. Okay. Yeah. Zone three. <laughs> you can always direct your questions to Charlie, incidentally. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. Thank you for hosting another wonderful weekend. Um, my name is Che Wei Wu. I'm a proud shareholder from right here in Omaha. One of the most interesting financial news developments this previous year was the near collapse of the hedge fund long-term capital. I'd like to get your thoughts and Mr. Munger's thoughts about how these private partnerships operate, um, what your thoughts about the long-term capital deal, and also the Fed's uh, uh, intervention to save it. Yeah, that, in that movie you saw, uh, the time when Yellowstone was, uh, when Old Faithful was, uh, was uh, performing in the background and, and Bill was trying to get me to watch that while I was on the phone. A lot of that trip was spent um, talking uh, to New York about uh, uh, making a bid for what we'll call LTCM, long-term capital management. And the, the, the caption on that photo is incidentally is known as the geezer and the geyser. Uh, the <laughs> and we were up in, we started in Alaska and we were going down these canyons in, in a boat and uh, the, uh, the captain say, now, you know, let's go over there and look at the sea lines. And I say, let's stay right where we are, where we've got a satellite channel, because I was trying to talk on the phone all the time. Charlie was in Hawaii, and uh, we never did get a chance to talk during that whole, that whole period. Uh, I, I didn't want to bother him with a little thing like a bid for $100 billion plus of securities, and I couldn't find him. Um, so it was, we were in an awkward place to pursue that. I think uh, it's possible that if I'd been in New York or Charlie had been in New York during that period that, uh, that our bid might have been accepted. There was just a report published within the last three or four days by a special committee uh, representing the, uh, the SEC, the Fed, uh, I think the Treasury, and the CFTC. I think I'm right on those four. And it, uh, it describes a, just a tiny bit of the events leading to the bid. It referred to our, it referred in on page 14, I remember it talked about uh, our transaction unraveling. It didn't unravel from our side. I mean, we made a firm bid for, for 100 billion plus of balance sheet assets and uh, many hundreds of billions, in fact, over a trillion of derivative contracts. And, uh, um, you know, this was in a market where where prices were moving around very dramatically. And with that bulk of assets there, uh, we thought we made a fairly good bid for a 45-minute or hour period. I don't think anybody else would have made the bid. But in any event, the, uh, the people at LTCM um, took the position that they could not accept that bid. Um, and therefore, the New York Fed uh, in, had a group uh, of largely investment banks there at, at, at the Fed, and, and that afternoon, uh, faced with the prospect that LTCM could not or would not accept our bid, they, they uh, uh, arranged another uh, uh, takeover arrangement where additional money was put in. Um, it's interesting, if you, read, if you read that report, which is put together by these four uh, very eminent bodies, and I think on the first page, it says that the first so-called hedge fund, which is the term generally applied to entities like LTCM, first hedge fund was set up in 1949. Uh, and I probably read that or heard that 50 times uh, in the last 
particularly in the last year. And of course, that's not true at all. And I've even pointed this out once or twice before. But Ben Graham had, and Jerry Newman, had a classical hedge fund back in the 20s. And I worked for, I worked dually for a company called Graham Newman Corp, which was a, a, a regulated investment company, and Newman and Graham, which was an investment partnership with a uh, I think a 20% participation in profits and, and exactly the sort of uh, entity that uh, today is called a hedge fund. So if you, if you read any place that the hedge fund concept originated in 1949, uh, presumably with A.W. Jones, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not an accurate uh, history. There are now, I ran something that would generally be called uh, uh, a hedge fund. I, I didn't like to think of it that way. I, I called it an investment partnership, but it would have been termed an, an hedge fund. Charlie ran one uh, from about, what, 1963 to mid-70s or thereabouts, and they have proliferated in a big way. Did, you, did he blink? Uh, 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 we, we, there are now hundreds of them, and of course it's very enticing to any money manager to run because if you do well, or even if you don't do so well, but the market does well, you can make a lot of money uh, a running one. Uh, this report that just came out uh, has really not, nothing particularly harsh uh, to say about the operation. So I think you will see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hedge funds. I think the current issue of Barron's may have a recap of how, how a large group did in the first quarter. And uh, th there's a lot of money in those funds. and. Uh, there's a huge incentive to form them, and there's a huge incentive to go out and attract more money if you, uh, if you run one. And when that condition exists in Wall Street, you can be sure that they won't uh, wither away. Charlie? Yeah, what was interesting about that one is how talented the people were, and yet they got in so much trouble. Uh, I think it also demonstrates uh, that uh, I'd say the general system of finance in America involving derivatives is irresponsible. Uh, there's way too much risk in all these trillions of notational value sloshing around the world. There's no clearing system as there is in a commodities market, and I don't think it's the last convulsion we're going to see in the der derivatives game. It, it's fascinating in that you had. 16 extremely bright, I mean, extremely bright people at the top of that. The average IQ would, would probably be as higher, higher than any organization you could find among their top 16 people. They individually had decades of experience and collectively had centuries of experience in operating in the sort of securities uh, in which the LTCM was invested, and they had a huge amount of money of their own up and probably a very high percentage of their net worth in almost every case up. So here you had super bright, extremely experienced people operating with their own money. And in effect on that day in September they were broke. And that, 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 to me that is absolutely fascinating. There was a book written, You Only Have to Get Rich Once. It's a great title. It's not a very good book. Walter Gutman wrote it, but it uh, many years ago. But the title is right. You only have to get rich once. And why do people, very bright people, risk losing something that's very important to them to gain something that's totally unimportant? The added money has no utility whatsoever. And the money that was lost had enormous utility, and on top of that, reputation is tarnished and all of that sort of thing. So that the, the gain-loss ratio, in any real sense, it's just incredible. I mean, it's like playing Russian roulette. I mean, if, if you hand me a revolver with six bullets and, you know, or six chambers and one bullet, and you say, pull it once for a million dollars, and I say no, and then you say, what is your price? The answer is there is no price. And there shouldn't be any price on taking the risk when you're already rich, particularly of, of, of failure and embarrassment and all of that sort of thing. But people repeatedly do it, and they do it uh, Whenever a bright person, really bright person, goes broke that has a lot of money, it's because of leverage. You simply, you, you, you basically can't, it'd be almost impossible to go broke uh, without 
borrowed money being in the equation. And uh, as you know, at Berkshire, we've, we've never used any real amount of borrowed money. Now, if we'd, if we'd used somewhat more, you know, we'd be really rich. But if we'd used a whole lot more, we might have gotten in trouble sometimes. And there's no, there's just no, there's no upside to it, you know. What's two percentage points more, you know, in a given year or that year, uh, and run the risk of, of, uh, of real failure. But very bright people do it, and they do it consistently, and they will continue to do it. And as long as uh, explosive type instruments are out there, uh, they will gravitate toward them. And particularly people will gravitate toward them who have very little to lose but are operating with, with other people's money. One of the things, for example, in the LTCM case, and Charlie mentioned it in terms of derivatives, in, in effect, there were ways found to get around the, uh, and they were legal, obviously, uh, to get around the margin requirements because uh, risk arbitrage is a business that Charlie and I have been in for 40 years in one form or another, and normally that means putting up the money to buy the stock on the long side and then shorting something uh, against it that, where you expect a merger or something to happen. But through derivatives, uh, people have found out how to do that, essentially putting up no money just by writing a derivative contract on both sides. And there are margin requirements, as you know, that the Fed promulgates that I believe still call for 50 percent uh, equity on, 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 on stock purchases. But those requirements do not apply if you arrange the transaction in derivative form so that these billions of dollars of positions in equities essentially were being uh, financed 100 percent by the people who wrote the derivative contracts. And that leads to trouble. It does, it, you know, 99 percent of the time it works. But, you know, 83 and a third percent of the time it works to play Russian roulette with, with uh, one bullet in there and six chambers. But neither 83 and a third percent or 99 percent is good enough when there is no gain to offset the risk of, of loss. I would argue that there uh, is a second factor that makes the situation dangerous, and that is that the accounting for uh, being actively engaged in derivatives, interest rate swaps, etc., is uh, very weak. Uh, I think the Morgan Bank was the last holdout, and uh, they finally flipped to a lenient standard of accounting that's favored by people who are sharing in the profits from trading derivatives, and naturally they like liberal accounting. So you got an irresponsible clearing system, irresponsible accounting. This is not a good combination. Oh. Yeah, J.P. Morgan shifted their accounting, I think, I'm not sure exactly when, around 1990, but Charlie and I, we probably became more familiar with that when we were back at Solomon, and uh, this is absolutely standard, you know, it's gap accounting. But it front ends profits. And uh, if you front end profits and you pay people a percentage of the profits, uh, you're going to get some very interesting results sometimes. Uh, zone four. Hi, uh, Dan Kurz from Bonita Springs, Florida. Um, you've given many clues to investors to help them calculate Berkshire's intrinsic value. I've attempted to calculate the intrinsic value of Berkshire using the discounted present value of its total look-through earnings. I've taken Berkshire's total look-through earnings and adjusted them for normalized earnings at Geico, the Supercat business, and General Re. Then I've assumed that Berkshire's total look-through earnings will grow at 15 percent per annum on average for 10 years, 10 years per annum for years 11 through 20, and that earnings stop growing after year 20 resulting in a coupon equaling year 20 earnings from the 21st year onward. Lastly, I've discounted those estimated earnings stream at 10 percent to get an estimate of Berkshire's intrinsic value. My question is, is this a sound method? Is there a risk-free interest rate, such as a 30-year treasury, which might be the more appropriate rate to use here, given the predict predictable nature of your consolidated income stream? Thank you. Well, that, that is a very good question, and because that, that is the sort of way we think in terms of looking at other businesses. Uh, uh, investment is the process of putting out money today to get more money back at some point in the future. And the question is, how far in the future, how much money, and, and what is the appropriate discount rate to take it back to the present day and determine how much you pay? 
And I would say you've stated the approach. Uh, uh, I, couldn't have, I couldn't state it better myself. Uh, the exact figures you want to use, whether you want to use 15 percent gains in earnings or 10 percent gains in the second decade, I would, I, you know, I have no comment on, 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 on those particular numbers, but you, uh, you, ha you have the right approach. We would probably, in terms, we would probably use a lower discount factor in, in, in uh, evaluating any business now under present day interest rates. Now, that doesn't mean we would pay that figure once we use that discount number, but we would use that to establish comparability across investment alternatives. So, if we were looking at 50 companies and making the sort of calculation that you just talked about, we would use a, we, we might, we would probably use the long term government rate to discount it back, but we wouldn't pay that number after we discounted it back. We would look for appropriate discounts from that figure. But it doesn't really make any difference whether you use a higher figure and, and then look across them or use, the, use our figure and look for the biggest discount. You've got the right approach, and then all you have to do is stick in the right numbers. And uh, you mentioned in terms of our clues, we try to give you all of the information that we would find useful ourselves in evaluating uh, Berkshire's intrinsic value. Uh, uh, in our reports, uh, you know, I can't think of anything we leave out that if Charlie and I uh, had been away for a year and we were trying to figure out, look at the, look at the situation fresh, evaluate things, there's, um, you know, there, there, there's, there's nothing, in my view, left out of our published materials. Now, one important element in Berkshire, which is a secondary factor that gets into what you're talking about there, is that because we retain all earnings and because we have a growth of float over time, we have a considerable amount of money to invest. And it really is the success with which we invest those retained earnings and growth and float that will have an important fact, be an important factor in how fast our intrinsic value grows. And to an important extent, the, what happens there is out of our control. I mean, it, it does depend on the markets in which we operate. So, if our, if our earnings plus float growth equals $3 billion or something like that in a current year, whether that $3 billion gets put to terrific use, satisfactory use, or no use at all virtually, really depends to a big extent on external factors. It also depends on, to some extent, on our, uh, our energy and, and, and insights and so on. But it's, the external world makes a big difference in the reinvestment rate. And, you know, your guess is as good as ours on that, but uh, if we run into favorable external circumstances, the ex your calculation of, of intrinsic values should, uh, w would result in a higher number than if we run into the kind of circumstances that we've had the last 12 months. Charlie? Yeah, for many decades around here, we've had roughly 100 percent, more than 100 percent of book net worth in marketable securities and had a lot of wonderful uh, wholly owned subsidiaries to boot. And, uh, and, and we've always had a very attractive place to put new money in as we generate it. Well, we still got the wonderful businesses, but we're having trouble with the new money. So no, it's not oh, trouble, sorry. really. To, have a pile of lovely money. This is not. I don't think there should be tears in the house. Have you ever run into any unlovely money, Charlie? <laughs> Zone five. Good morning. My name is Ronald Towell. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and very uh, appreciative of your graciousness as a host for this wonderful weekend. My question has to do with the <laughs> My question has to do with the retailing industry, particularly the department stores and mass merchants. My question has two parts. Without resorting to comments about specific companies, may I ask your opinion as to the long-term prospects for growth and profitability of this industry group? The second part of my question is Given the fact that it is difficult to pick up a newspaper or to be an investor without being bombarded by what is purported to be the potential for exponential growth in the internet e-business, particularly directly to consumers, 
which could possibly eat into the revenues of these retailers. And if, even if we assume a relatively low impact of, say, 5 to 10 percent revenue reductions, and given the fact that top-line growth is critical to any business, especially the bricks and mortar retailers with their high proportions of fixed overhead, what advice could you give to a CEO of such a company? And in turn, based on the preceding scenario, what would be your opinion of the medium and long-term prospects for this industry? Well, uh, that's a good question, too. And <clears throat> obviously, the Internet is going to have an important impact on retailing. It will have a huge impact on some forms of retailing, <clears throat> change them and maybe revolutionize them. I think there are some other areas where it'll, the impact will be less, but any time we buy into a business, and ha any time we've bought in for some time, we have tried to think of what that business is going to look like in 5 or 10 or 15 years, and we recognize that the Internet, in many forms of retailing, is likely to pose such a threat that we simply wouldn't want to get into the business. I mean, it, uh, uh, not that we can measure it perfectly, but, but there are a number of retailing operations <clears throat> that we think are threatened, and we do not think that's the case in furniture retailing, and we have three very important operations there. We could be wrong, but uh, so far that, you know, that would be my judgment that furniture retailing will not be hurt. You've seen other forms of retailing where you're already starting to see uh, some inroads being made, but, the, but it's just started. The Internet is going to be a huge force in many arenas, but it'll certainly be a huge force in retailing. Now, it may benefit us uh, in certain areas. I would expect the Internet to benefit uh, Borsheim's in a very big way, and you noticed in the, in the movie that we talked about Borsheims.com coming online in, in May. There's something up there now, but you'll see a new format uh, within a month or so. Now, you might say in, in, in jewelry retailing, you know, with millions of things that you can click on to, 10 years from now, you know, who is going to be important in terms of online uh, retailing of jewelry? I would argue that, that two firms have a, an enormous advantage going in. I would argue that Tiffany has a, such an advantage. We don't own any Tiffany, but I would say that because of their name, brand names are going to mean very, very much uh, when you have literally, you know, thousands and thousands of choices. People can't. They have to trust somebody. And I think that Tiffany has a name that, that people would trust. And I think Borsheim's has a name that people would trust. And Borsheim's sells jewelry a whole lot cheaper than Tiffany. So I would say that that people who are price conscious but also want to deal, deal with a jeweler that they trust implicitly will find their way to, to, uh, to Borsheim's uh, in increasing numbers uh, over the Internet. And I would say that people that like the blue box, you know, are going to find their way to Tiffany's uh, over time and they'll pay more money. Um, but I don't see them going for brand X uh, in buying fine jewelry over the Internet. So I think that with the brand that Borsheim's has and with, with uh, careful nurturing of that brand, I, I would say that the Internet offers Borsheim's a chance to have the advantage in cost that comes from a huge one-store location and yet also go into the homes of people in, in every part of the world. And uh, that kind of a company should prosper. Um, there are other of our companies I worry about, you know, I can worry about them uh, being hurt in various ways. Geico is, a, is going to be a big beneficiary of the Internet, and we already are developing substantial business through it. But I, I, if I were to buy, buy into any retailing business, whether I was buying the stock of it or buying the whole business, I would think very hard about uh, what people are going to be trying to do to that business uh, through the Internet. And, and you know, it affects, it affects real estate that is dedicated to retailing. Uh, if you... Uh, substitute 5% of the retail volume uh, uh, via the Internet where real estate is essentially free. They're, they're, you, know, they're, they're, you, you can have a store in, in, every, in every town in the world through the Internet without having any rental expense. Uh, so I would, be think, I, would, I would give a lot of thought to that if I were, if I were owning a lot of retail um, a rental space. Charlie? Well, I, I think it is... Uh 
tricky predicting that technological change either will or won't destroy some business. When I was young, the department stores had a bunch of sort of monopolistic advantages. A, they were downtown where the streetcar lines met. B, they had sort of a monopoly on extending revolving credit. And D, they had one-stop shopping in all kinds of weather. And nobody else did. And they lost all three of those advantages. And yet they've done well, a lot of them, for many decades since. At other times, you get a change and you just get destroyed. Uh, our trading stamp business was destroyed by changes in the economic world, and our world book business has been seriously hurt by the personal computer and the CD-ROM and so forth. Uh, yeah, I agree it's a big risk, but it's, it, it's not easy to, uh, to make predictions in which you have great confidence. Yeah, if you go down to 16th and Farnham here where the streetcar tracks used to cross, that was the, that was the best real estate in town, and, and people signed 100-year, 50-year leases on it, and it, it looked like there was nothing more safe because they weren't going to move the streetcar lines. The only thing was that they moved the streetcars. They just took and converted them into junk. Um, and it seemed very permanent. But the advantage of the big department store, the Marshall Field in Chicago or the Macy's in New York, was this incredible breadth of merchandise. You could go and you could find 300 different types of spools of thread or 500 different, you could see 500 different wedding dresses or whatever. And you had these million square foot and even two million square foot downtown stores. And they were these huge emporiums. And then the shopping center came along. And of course, the shopping center created, in effect, a store of many stores. And so you had millions of square feet now, and, and, but you still had this incredible variety being offered. The internet becomes a store in your, you know, in your computer, and it has an incredible variety of, of, of offerings, too. Some of them don't lend themselves very well, it seems to me, to, to retailing, and, and, you know, and others do. Uh, uh, but Charlie's right. It, it, it's hard to predict exactly how it will turn out. I would expect, I would expect uh, you know, automobile retailing to change in, in some important ways. And, in part, in, in very significant part, influenced by the internet. But I wouldn't, you know, I can't predict exactly how that'll happen. But uh, I don't think it'll look the same 10 or 15 years from now. Zone six. Um, ben Knoll, and I'm from Minneapolis, although I'd like to enhance my status by noting that I was uh, born and raised in Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> It just well, moved up. <laughs> well, well, like many others, I read Alice Schroeder's analysis of Berkshire Hathaway with great interest this last year. And she described her analysis as a toolkit for investors. And I'm wondering if you see any substantial flaws in any of her toolkit, and, and in particular the float-based valuation model that she put together. Yeah. What are your views on that? Well, I don't want to comment on valuation, but I, I, uh, I I can tell you that Alice is a first-class and serious analyst who, who spent a lot of time on Berkshire and, and, and uh, probably produced the first comprehensive report, at least it's been widely circulated in, in the history of Berkshire. It's kind of interesting that we got to $100 billion of market value before anybody really published a report about the company. But I, I, Alice understands the insurance business very well. Uh, she's an accountant. Uh, by background, and she, so she understands numbers, and she did a lot of work on the uh, report. Uh, and I do recommend it to you as a toolkit. I make no comment at all about valuation. Charlie? Uh, nothing to add. Zone 7. Uh, hello, I'm Martin Wiegand from Chevy Chase, Maryland. I want to thank you for the hospitality this weekend and the wisdom you share with us uh, each year in your annual reports. As a small businessman, one of the trickiest jobs I have is dividing up the profits of our business between the employees who generate them. Would you comment and share your thoughts on how you divide up the profits of the Berkshire Hathaway subsidiaries with the employees who generate them? And the follow-up is, Mr. Munger, do you have any suggested reading on that subject? Yeah, we're glad to have you here, Martin. Uh, I went to, uh, to high school and to the first couple years of college with, with Martin's uh, father who's also here today and so if you get a chance to meet uh, Marty 
uh, Janie and younger Martin, uh, say hello to them. Um, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, uh, arrangements we have with compensation, uh, they vary uh, to an extraordinary degree among the various subsidiaries we have because we have bought existing businesses and we have tampered as little as possible with their cultures after we buy them. And some of those cultures are very different than others. I mean, you, you know, you saw Mrs. B earlier. Uh, you know, you, as you can imagine, uh, she would leave a very strong imprint on any business with which she was involved. And we have a number of very talented managers who have worked out the systems that they believe to be best uh, for their companies. Now, it is true that if, we, if there's a stock option plan at a company, we will substitute a plan that is performance-based which ties much more clearly to the performance of the business than any option plan could. And we will, have a ha we will design one that has an expectable cost that's equal to the expectable cost of the option plan. So we try to equate the, the cost. We try to make it even more, much more sensible from both the owner's standpoint and the employee's standpoint in terms of the way it pays off based on how that, that business performs. Um, you probably read in our annual report how we, we have put an across-the-board plan at GEICO that, that ties with our objectives. But basically, that was Tony Nicely's work uh, in terms of developing that plan. I mean, he and I thought alike about what counted, and he, he, he developed a compensation grid that applied to everybody in the whole place uh, based on achieving the objectives that he felt were important and that we felt were important. Um, you will find, if you go to any Berkshire subsidiary, you'll probably find that they have a compensation plan that's quite similar, with the exception of options, to the plan that they had before we bought them, uh, bought the operation. They have successful businesses, uh, and, and people get there a different ways. Some people bat left-handed, some people bat right-handed. You know, some people stand deep in the batter's box, some, you know, some crowd the plate. They all have different styles. And the styles of our managers have proven successful in their own businesses. We keep the same managers, so we don't try and superimpose any, any, any um, system from above with the exception of, uh, of what I've mentioned. We do like the idea of paying for, for, for performance. I mean, that is it's kind of a fundamental tenet. Everybody says they like that, but then they design systems that, that pay off no matter what happens in many cases, and we've been reluctant to do that. Charlie? Yeah, I think it's important for the shareholders to realize that we are probably more decentralized in terms of personnel practices than any company uh, of our size or bigger in America. We don't have a headquarters culture that's forced on the operating businesses. Uh, the operating businesses have their own cultures, and in, I think in Every case I can think of, it's a wonderful culture, and we, we just leave them alone. It uh, comes naturally to me. Charlie says we don't have a headquarters culture. Sometimes people think we don't have a headquarters. It, uh, <laughs> we have no human relations department at Berkshire. We have no, we have no legal department. We have no investor relations. We have no public relations. We don't, we don't have any of that sort of thing. We've, we've got a bunch of all-stars, as we put on the screen, out there running businesses. And we asked them to mail the money to Omaha. But uh, yeah. we'll even give them a stamp if they request it. But beyond that, we don't, we, we don't really go. And it, uh, it would be foolish. And, and what, what, what is interesting to me is how I had a lot of preconceived ideas of what motivates people when I started out in business. But you can find certain organizations that resist paying uh, stars on an individual basis. They like to think of themselves as a team, and they'd rather have a team concept of, of, of payment. And uh, you can see others where it's, they're much more individually oriented. Actually, Charlie can probably tell you about that in terms of law firms. I mean, some law firms have a culture that is, uh, is much more star-oriented than others. And you know, you've seen successes in both places, haven't you, Charlie? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember a case when anybody has 
transferred from one operating Berkshire subsidiary to another. It's very rare. Yeah. Yeah, we don't try and cross fertilize. We just um, we think we've got a good thing going in you know in in every plot of ground, and we just uh, assume they'll they'll do best if left to their own initiative. Um, zone eight. I'm Brian Phillips from Chickamauga, Georgia, and my question is if with regards to an insurance company, if you can use the float for cheap financing, why would you issue a fairly priced bond? Why would it, we do what? Issue a fairly priced bond. Yeah, well, the best, the best form of financing for us is, is cheap float. Now, most insurance companies don't generate cheap float. So, I mean, there, there are plenty of companies in, in the insurance business who, who have a cost of float that makes it unattractive, actually, to expand their businesses. Our insurance companies have had a terrific experience on cost of float, and we would develop, develop it just as fast as we can. Right now, we would have no interest in issuing a, a bond because we, we have more money around than, than we know what to do with, and it comes from low-cost float. But if there came a time when things were very attractive and we had utilized all the money from our float and from retained earnings and all of that to invest, and we still saw opportunities, we might very well borrow moderate amounts of money in the market. It would cost us more than our float was costing us, but it still incrementally would provide provide earnings. Now, you know, we would we would try to gain more float under those circumstances as well, but we would not just quit when we ran out of money from float. We would we would go ahead and borrow moderate amounts of money. We would we would never borrow huge amounts of money though. Charlie? Well, I agree. Mm. Okay. You can see why we've been partners a long time. <laughs> <laughs> now we go to some off some sites away from this main hall, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do this, but we'll go to Zone 9 and see if Zone 9 comes in. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Howard Love. I'm from San Francisco. Thank you very much for this weekend in general and uh, this meeting in particular. Uh, recently at a talk at the Wharton Business School, uh, Mr. Buffett, you indicated that you were talking about the problems of compounding large size, uh, which I appreciate and understand. But you indicated, uh, you're quoted in the local paper as saying that you are confident that if you were working with a sum closer to a million dollars, that you could compound that, that at a 50% uh, rate. For those of us who aren't saddled with the $100 billion problem, uh, could you talk about uh, what types of investments you'd be looking at and where uh, in today's market you think significant inefficiencies exist? Thank you. Yeah. I. I think I may have been very slightly misquoted, but I certainly said something to the effect that working, I, I think I, I, I talked about this group I get together every two years and how I poll that group as to what they think they could compound money at it with 100,000, a million, 100 million, a billion, and other types of sums. And I pointed out how this group of 60 or so people that I get together with every couple of years, how their expectations of return would go very rapidly down this slope. Uh, it is true. I think I, I think I can name a half a dozen people that I think could compound a uh, million dollars, or at least they could earn 50 percent a year on a million dollars. Have that as an ex expectation, uh, if they needed it. I mean, I'd have to, they'd have to get their full attention to be working on the sum. And those people could not compound money a hundred million or a billion at anything remotely like that rate. I mean, there, there are little tiny areas which, if you follow what I said on the screen there on that Adam Smith uh, interview a few years ago. If you start with A and you go through and you just and you look at everything and you find small securities in your area of competence that you can understand the business, I think you can and, and occasionally find little arbitrage situations or little wrinkles here and there in the market. I think working with a very small sum that there is an opportunity to earn very high returns, but that that advantage disappears very rapidly as the money compounds because I, you know, from a million to 10 million, I would say it would fall off dramatically uh, uh, in terms of the expectable rate because there are, there are little, you, you find very, very small things that, that, you know, you can make and you're almost certain to make high returns on, but you don't find very big things that in that category today. Uh, I'll leave to you the fun of finding them yourselves. I mean, Terrible to spoil the treasure hunt, uh, 
And the truth is I don't look for them anymore. Every now, every now and then I'll stumble into something just by accident. But, but I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not in the business of looking for that. I'm, I'm looking for things that Berkshire could put, put its money in, and, and that rules out all of that sort of thing. Uh, uh, Charlie? Well, I would agree, but I would, uh, I would also say that what we did 40 or so years ago was in some respects more simple than what you're going to have to do. Right. We had it very easy compared to you. It can still be done, but, uh, but it's, it's harder now. You have to know more. I mean, just sifting through the manuals until you find something that's selling at two times earnings, uh, that won't work for you. It'll work, it's just you won't find any. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, zone 10, please. My name is Jonathan Brandt. I'm from New York City. Warren, you wrote in 1977 that the return on equity and growth of book value for corporate America tended towards and averaged about 13%, no matter the inflation environment. After properly expensing options and so-called non-recurring charges and taking into account the high price earnings ratio paid for increasingly frequent acquisitions, do you think that 13% figure is still roughly correct? Also, what quantitative method would you suggest that investors use for expensing the option grants of publicly traded firms where there is no realistic prospect for the substitution of such an options program with a cash-based performance incentive plan? In other words, how do you derive the 5 to 10% earnings dilution referred to in this year's Berkshire's annual report and is it possible that the dilution figure could be even higher than that? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Johnny. Uh, just like Martin Wigan, um, John, John Brandt is the uh, son of a very good friend of mine that, where we worked together for, for decades, and, uh, and, and John is now an analyst with, uh, with uh, Ruane Kniff and, uh, and a very good one. Uh, he also, he, he says it didn't happen this way, but but when he was about four years old, I was at his, the house for dinner with the parents, and he suggested to me after dinner, he said, how about a game of chess? I looked at this four-year-old, and I thought, you know, this is the kind of guy who said, should we play for money? And, uh, <laughs> and he said, name your stakes, so I backed off. And uh, we, sat, 